Now that we have looked at nominal versus real GDP, we're going to talk about calculating inflation using the GDP deflator approach. You'll notice that in my slides, I kind of fast track through the process. I explain briefly how they, they might, you might see it in the textbook. Uh, but for me, for this class, when I talk about GDP deflator and later on when I'll talk about CPI, I'm really interested in the inflation level. And that's what we want to focus on in this class. But if you want to see the other way, uh, I invite you to look through the book, but it's a two-step approach to finding inflation, whereas I do it in a single step. So essentially, how do we find uh, inflation level using the GDP deflator approach? Well, this first value here will give us the GDP deflator. What I'm really interested in is calculating inflation. So this pi sign here, uh, which is used in mathematics, can be slightly confusing. In macroeconomics, it's used as uh, inflation. In microeconomics, it's used as profit. It's just the way it's been used in the past. Uh, but essentially, in this class here, this pi sign will represent inflation. And I write GDP here because later on, I'll have inflation using the CPI approach. So using the GDP deflator approach, you have nominal over real GDP minus one times 100. The only thing that you might confuse on is nominal versus real. We'll just see it as nominal will always be bigger than the real if there is inflation. So it has to be on top because otherwise if the bigger one's on the bottom, this number here will be smaller than one. Minus one will give you a negative number and will give you a negative inflation. So make sure that you put the bigger one on top and and the bigger one should be if the prices have gone up. So I noticed in my previous example that all the prices went up, so I know that my nominal will be greater, so the bigger number goes on top. So in this case here, I have it on the next slide, but it's gonna be that 3510 over to 1900. Uh, not the 1900, actually, it's the real GDP over to 2440. So you see that's one of the mistakes you could easily make. So that over that, minus one, and this whole amount here times 100 will give me my G, uh, inflation using the GDP deflator approach. So keep in mind here, as I quickly made a, a very minor mistake, it's the idea that you have to have nominal on top, real at the bottom. So it's not another nominal because otherwise you'll be calculating the percentage change of nominal GDP from one year to the next. Here we're looking at just stripping out what's that percentage change in um, price level, overall price level. And as I mentioned before, since I had some goods that were going up by 20% and other goods going up by 50%, you should ask yourself, well, it has to be somewhere between those amounts. Because there's more goods at 50%, uh, might have a bigger impact. It depends on the weights that we had. So let's just see what it gives. Um, I guess 43.85%. So 43.85% is closer to the 50%, but it's still within that range. So all of this um, gives us an idea of how to calculate inflation using the GDP deflator approach. We'll talk about it a little bit more in chapter six after we've done the CPI. Uh, but for now, make sure you have a good grasp of this because you'll have to calculate it uh, sooner or later for sure. Here's just a, a little table to show historically how real GDP has changed over time. So we talked about nominal versus real and we talked about why we want to use real GDP. And you can see here that they're using a certain year's dollars. So here they haven't chosen the dollars from the base year. They haven't chosen the dollars from the final year. They've chosen another arbitrary year. Sometimes there's certain reasons why they would do that. 2007 being before this. Uh, recession that happened in 2008-2009 so that could be one of the reasons why they chose uh, those dollars but essentially we're looking at the value of production in the Canadian economy and uh, as we'll go through these next chapters we'll notice that these shaded areas have been recessions that's why there's been drops in real GDP over these periods uh, but essentially this is what we're seeing so we're seeing an upward trend of real GDP and an upward trend of real GDP is a good sign. But the big thing, so in, in all of this, <clears throat> we've stripped out the inflation calculation. Uh, we've sh stripped off, uh, I mean, the influence of inflation of an increase in price levels. So all of this is in a certain year's dollar term. So we're actually producing more between 1970 and let's say uh, over here, uh, 
2010-ish were about three times the value of production. So of course we can have more cars and more other things per household as we did in the past because we're producing more. Uh, but the big thing that this whole graph uh, forgets is that this is based on total population. So what has happened to population growth over this time? If population growth has tripled over these same years, that I was looking at, well, essentially the, the GDP per person hasn't changed. So what's gonna be very important to look at was that GDP per person we had before, or GDP per capita means the same thing, it's just GDP per person. So just something to keep in mind when you see different stats saying, oh, we've had a big growth, well, how much has population grown by, and other factors such as that. So that's it for GDP deflator, and uh, we're gonna look at some of the pitfalls of using GDP approach if we're thinking about uh, the welfare of the Canadian citizens or citizens of another country next.